You might have noticed we had three Gospels read today. That was a, a hat trick of Gospels, I guess. Um, it happens to be one of those days where the feasts line up where we just can't ignore any of them. Uh, one uh, of the Gospels was for St. Basil, whose feast we celebrate on January 1st at the crown of the year. Um, there's no mistake there. Uh, the word Basil uh, or Basileia for, for, it means king or queen in Greek. So it's the kingly part of the year, the crown of the year. Uh, so St. Basil is remembered on, on this day on, uh, for a reason. Uh, we also had a gospel for the forefeast of Theophany, which approaches very swiftly. Pay attention, we have a liturgy this week coming up, one of the great feasts of the Lord. So uh, it's a good day to call <coughs> off sick from work and uh, see your physician, the divine physician, come to church uh, on the feast, um, the, 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 the sixth. Uh, and we also had uh, a gospel before the feast of the circumcision of Christ which is eight days after we celebrate his birth. So we have three feasts to commemorate today. So that means that we need three homilies. <laughs> Don't worry, I've only got one, but we probably should have three. They're all very important, and I don't know which one to skip. The narrative of the gospel that we read for the circumcision of Christ okay. is very short. It doesn't talk a lot about the child being circumcised. In fact, it's not one of the great feasts of the Lord. It is remembered, it's always commemorated on the 1st of January, which is eight days after the 25th of December, which means that's the day, traditionally eight days after the birth, where the child was circumcised, according to Mosaic law, according to the Old Covenant. And indeed, Christ being God but born under the law, the lawgiver was circumcised, fulfilling the law. And so we celebrate that. But it doesn't mention much about it. Instead, it fast forwards to when he's 12. Now, I am on my sixth 12-year-old boy and final 12-year-old boy, at least of my own issue. They're all some of my issues. I am on my sixth 12 year old boy. There he sits. And any of you who have raised a 12 year old boy, I have uh, had a couple of 12 year old daughters as well, and I've got uh, a few more up and coming. Uh, they're quite different. Uh, and most of you could probably attest to that. What characterizes a 12 year old boy is boisterousness and boldness, sometimes even brashness. And I love this narrative so much. And you don't hear about anything about Christ's youth other than in Matthew's Gospel, uh, you know, the genealogy and uh, the birth and the, and the infancy narrative, the, the nativity narrative. You see that in a few places. But you don't hear anything about Christ's lifetime as a child growing up until he's baptized in the Jordan by John, except in the Gospel of Luke. Makes sense. Luke's Gospel is the Gospel of the Mother of God. They are known to have been very close to one another, and all of the biographical information that we have in Scripture comes out of the Gospel of Luke, and there's precious little of it at that. Except for this one vignette, this one image, this one story. And of course it's told from a mother's perspective. There's details about how long they had gone outside of Jerusalem to return, to Nazareth, and then there's details about them searching for him for three days, and then there's the almost exasperated, where have you been? Did you not know we've been looking for you? This is clearly told from the perspective of a mother. Could you imagine? You gave birth to God and you lost him? You've got some explaining to do. Most of us have panicked when we haven't found our children. I've left my son D uh, more than three times on, on our parish campouts. Uh, we thought that, that, that each of us thought he was in the other car. Uh, and uh, we'd have to retrace our steps and find him usually waiting on a bench for us. That was nerve-wracking enough. Anybody lose their kid in the mall? Anybody have to get the embarrassing page over the PA at the grocery store? With your name? And you're like, oh, I'm going to kill him. That's what, 10 minutes? 
Half an hour? This is five days. They've gone a day. They've had to come back a day and search for him for three. Could you imagine? Any of you mothers, and fathers included too, but this is a mother's perspective. How many of you wouldn't have been panicking? I see no hands, and nor should I. And they said, in, the, in Luke's Gospel, it says, he was in the temple, teaching and asking questions, or asking questions and answering questions in the temple. And they were astonished at his understanding. Could you imagine the questions that Christ would have been asking them as a 12-year-old? Now remember, this in the, in the, the epistle to the Colossians, we hear St. Paul say, In him is the fullness of the Godhead. And that was true at his birth, at his conception, and at every point on his growing up. In our timeline, linearly, that was true at every moment. It, he, he possessed the fullness of the Godhead. But he was also a 12-year-old boy who was in the temple where he, was, where he should have been. He was teaching in the synagogue wherever he was. Astonishing them with his questions and his answers to their questions. Who would think a boy of this age could answer questions? And then his mother comes in and says, Where have you been? My God, where have you been? She could say that then. <laughs> For Christ's sake, where have you been? <laughs> and he says to her, Why did you seek me? You know that I had to be in my father's house. <laughs> and the way the evangelist words it is, Mary, Mary didn't understand what he said and pondered these things in her heart. If I'd lost my 12-year-old son for five days and he was there yakking with some people, I'd probably want to snatch him bald at it. <laughs> but they, and it said he went with them back and he was subject to them in a most humble way. He didn't rebuke her by saying that. He didn't say, leave me alone, Mom. I'm talking to my friends. He says, why have you sought me? <clears throat> Don't you know that I need to be in my father's house. That is the one image that we have of Christ from after his birth, or after the wise men anyway, he was two then, uh, until, uh, until his baptism in the Jordan by John. We hear that he was a carpenter, he was raised by Joseph, Joseph's gone by the time Christ is baptized, clearly he was an old man and had already reposed. We don't hear anything else about Jesus except for this, this gospel narrative when he's in the temple. And it might go unnoticed other than it's the gospel of the mother of God, clearly. And clearly Luke remembers this story from her. And they didn't waste paper and ink. They didn't waste animal skin parchments to, to, make, uh, to write down their the gospel narratives. This was important, and Luke understood it was important. And we also must understand that we have to look at this image of Christ as important for us. He returned with them and was subject to them. This is the Almighty God. This is the artificer of the cosmos. <clears throat> and he returned with his parents and was subject to them, as he should be, because he was twelve. Just because he was God didn't mean that he didn't need to be a helpless child nursing at the breast. He was fully God, but he couldn't feed himself physically. He became a human being and submitted himself to being powerless and helpless. He submitted himself to being born in a cave and being raised relatively poor <clears throat> and having nothing. He submitted himself to being 
crucified on a cross. Because this is what was made and right. This is what was meant to be. I was recently gifted this icon. It's a, it's a rather newly appearing icon on the scene. It's, I believe it's called Mother of Humility. And it's maybe hard to see. They're both wearing white in this photograph. Or this, photograph uh, this icon. But you have the Mother of God enthroned next to her son. And he's leaned over in her lap. Not in a submissive necessarily position, or he is again the king enthroned in the heavens at the right hand of God. As God, the king rules. But look at this perfect image of his mother to whom he was subject. Do we ever stop honoring our parents? He was the law giver, but he was also the law receiver as being born in the flesh. One of the injunctions in the Ten Commandments is to honor thy father and mother. He is still a human being. What an absolutely gorgeous image of a son's love for his mother and deference to her motherhood as her son, even as God. He showed us the fullness of humility with the cross. But he also demonstrates his humility in being subject to his earthly parents. You cannot turn a page in the Gospels without hearing and seeing and embodying the experience of a Lord who is absolutely humble. If there's any message that you should take out of the Gospels, it is humility. It is what unlocks heaven, the cross. How do we crucify ourselves? How do we, <clears throat> excuse me, how do we circumcise our hearts? Except through humility. The fact that we celebrate the Feast of the Circumcision of Christ in such close proximity to the Feast of Christ's baptism is not a mistake. Now, baptism is not to be understood in a Christian context as replacing circumcision. That is actually a mistake that a lot of people make. You can see a correlation, but they are not to be seen as correlative uh, in such a way as to, it fulfills the, the uh, circumcision. <coughs> baptism and circumcision are, are quite different. But you can see a similar pattern of behavior. This is how one participates and belongs. How do we participate in Christ? He was humble enough to be circumcised in the flesh. He was humble enough to take on baptism, being baptized by the greatest man he's had ever born of woman, John the Baptist. He was humble enough to be crucified on a cross. He's humble enough for us to have this image in our hearts of Christ. Humble love for his mother, and by that for all mankind. We can place our face right here where the mother of God's face is in the icon. And it would be the same icon. If we are humble enough, if we allow ourselves to be humbled, enough to be God bearers, to be theotokoi, I think that's the plural in Greek then you would see the same image of Christ's deference to us as God. Such was his humility. This is an image of eternity. He was subjecting his human self to his human parents. And he makes himself subject to us. My goodness, the cross is the perfect image of this. This, by the way, is the cross. This image right here, forgive me, everybody behind me doesn't know what I'm talking about. I forgot to turn around and show you the video. Uh, let's pretend I showed it to you earlier. This is an image of the cross. Humility. The message is consistent. It has not changed. If we recognize that, if we embody that, if we make this the image written on our hearts, then we have truly taken up our cross. We have truly circumcised our hearts. 
we have truly submitted ourselves in vulnerability to the other. This is the image that we need to walk away with from this day's feast and in the coming feast of Christ's baptism. They're all there on purpose together, related, interwoven with one another. Isn't the story of the fabric of the tapestry of our salvation fascinating? The more you learn about it, the more fascinating it becomes. Let us learn humility and we will learn all things. Christ is circumcised in the flesh. Christ is circumcised in the flesh.